morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Scott Ashton. I'm the CEO of, of the Oceanside Chamber. I just want to welcome you to our first Emerging Issues Forum of 2021. Um, before we get started with our presentations, I just wanted to um, introduce, I, I think you all know her, but uh, Haley Wansley is the new Chamber Chair um, for this year, um, starting right now, starting January 1st. And uh, Haley, uh, Haley gets to be our chair during the Chamber's 125th anniversary celebration um, this year. So we've been serving our community since 1896. So um, I just want to give Haley the opportunity to say a few words before we have our presentation. Thanks. Good morning and Happy New Year. I'm so excited to be the chair of the Chamber Board and it wouldn't be possible without all of you and the Chamber Board themselves and the staff and Scott. They're incredible CEO. So I'm just excited to figure out how we continue to adapt and innovate and figure out ways to bring purposeful events and networking opportunities and educational opportunities to our community. Um, I think that we've really shown who we are as Oceansiders and I couldn't be prouder. So um, I live up here in Fire Mountain. I helped the chamber start their Young Professionals Network about a little over a year ago. And I'm just really excited about upskilling our workforce, collaborating with our K through 12 education and our higher education um, and seeing what we can do for our economy. So thanks for having me. And again, happy new year. Thanks, Haley. So we are gonna learn a lot about water today. And I do wanna point out that the water I am drinking is out of a water cup from the Oceanside Utilities and Water Department. So, um, but I am going to, Give you a little bit of information about our two presenters and then I'll turn it over to Carrie Dale. Um, so our um, one of our presenters is Sandra Curl who's the general manager of the San Diego County Water Authority. Um, Sandy joined the Water Authority as deputy general, general manager in November of 2009 and served as acting general manager from March through November of 2019 before being appointed by the board of directors to her current post. Uh, Sandy has more than 25 years of progressively responsible experience in all aspects of municipal management. Carrie Dale is a water utilities director for the city of Oceanside. In this position, she is responsible for the management of full service water, sewer, and solid waste utility services for the Oceanside community. And since 2010, Carrie has been working towards meeting the city council's goal of 50% local water supply development by the year 2030, a goal which will be achieved by implementation of pure water Oceanside, recycled water and groundwater programs. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Carrie. Okay, thank you very much for having me here today and happy new year, everybody. It's great to see everyone. Um, I'm just gonna wait just a moment while Chris pulls up the presentation. As Scott mentioned, Council did set a very ambitious goal for us to develop our, our local water supplies um, locally here by 2030. Next slide, Chris. And currently, only about 11% of our supplies are produced locally from our groundwater resources in the Mission Basin, as well as recycled water. Um, after implementation of the programs that I'll be speaking about today, we'll be um, on our way to meeting that goal in the next few years. Next slide. Both of the water supply projects, Pure Water Oceanside, as well as the, our recycled water systems, are located at the San Luis Rey Water Reclamation Facility, which is pictured here. We're on North River Road and um, back up to Camp Pendleton, which you'll see in the background of that picture. The San Luis Rey uh, Water Reclamation Facility will be our centralized wastewater treatment plant. Um, in the coming years, as you may know, we do have plans to decommission the La Salina Wastewater Treatment Plant adjacent to the Buccaneer Park. And um, it's taken many, many years of planning and work for us to be at the point today where we are now constructing these facilities. Next slide. The first project I'm going to talk about is Pure Water Oceanside. And I was here at the Chambers 
uh, with, with the Emerging Issues Forum, it must have been two years ago. Um, I was thinking back, it was quite a while ago, and we were talking about Pure Water Oceanside as we kicked off some of our public relations on the project. Next slide. Before I go into any of the construction, I wanted to just review some of the treatment processes that are found at Pure Water. It's a little different than some of our, our other treatment facilities, but these are state-of-the-art water purification steps, and they replicate and accelerate nature's natural recycling process. Um, as I mentioned, um, we start at the San Luis Rey facility where um, we produce recycled water that is then purified through three steps using this advanced technology. After the recycled water goes through ultra filtration, which filters out particles from the recycled water that are 300 times smaller than the human hair, it undergoes reverse osmosis, which is a treatment technology used at a lot of desalination facilities, including our Mission Basin facility. That um, removes additional particles such as salts, chemicals, bacteria, viruses, microplastics, and pharmaceuticals. The water next is treated by ultraviolet light, advanced oxidation, which uses ultraviolet light and chlorine to neutralize any remaining substances. So that's a disinfection step. It's the same technology used to sterilize surgical equipment and baby food jars. Um, next slide, Chris. This video is a great way to kind of illustrate then where the water goes after it is treated. It's um, injected into the aquifer through a series of injection wells where it's blended with native Mission Basin aquifer water. The water is then extracted through wells and then is treated at our Mission Basin Water Reclamation Facility. It's actually the building in the background of my um, Zoom slide here. It's treated again there and then is distributed to customers. Next slide. We had a groundbreaking ceremony in February of 2020, just before uh, the oh, pandemic hit. And um, it sounds like it's back to me. We, um, sorry, I'm getting a little background yeah. noise there. We had um, started the project conceptually in 2012, and so it's taken us about eight years to get to this step. Um, during our groundbreaking ceremony, we inserted a Google pin um, to commemorate being on the map. So if you do a Google search for Pure Water Oceanside, it actually comes up. This is a picture of all our VIPs that were part of our ceremony. It includes Congressman Levin, um, our Oceanside City Council, um, Esther Sanchez, Ryan Keim, and Jack Feller. Uh, Sandy Curl from the Water Authority is pictured there next to me, Mina Westford from Metropolitan Water District, both our partners in this, um, Jack Symes from the Bureau of Reclamation, and um, Lindsay Leahy, who is to the left of me, or the far, le far left of the um, picture, is really the mastermind behind all of the construction that I'll be talking about um, in the coming slides. So fortunately, we did not have any sort of construction shutdown because of the pandemic. Um, so we have been working continuously since about a year ago on making these facilities um, come to life. The overall project for Pure Water Oceanside consists of a treatment facility, pipelines and wells as shown here in this graphic and is being constructed under five separate construction uh, contracts valued at $70 million. As I mentioned, construction is well underway and we anticipate most of the construction to be complete this summer, making Pure Water Oceanside uh, the first project of this kind in San Diego County. Next slide, please. This is a drone video that was taken during our groundbreaking ceremony. It is of the San Luis Rey facility. And um, I wanted you to just take note of the area on the left near the large tank. There is a, a ground area that is disturbed. That's the area of focus that we'll be talking about next. That is the area where the Pure Water Oceanside Treatment Facility will be constructed. Side. And this is what it will ultimately look like when it is complete. 
It is a totally enclosed facility with the microfiltration, reverse osmosis, and ultraviolet light processes that I talked about earlier being totally enclosed um, within the building. It uh, follows the Gilman architectural style that you'll see at a lot of our city facilities currently, such as City Hall, the San Luis Rey Water Reclamation Facility, as well as the Mission Basin Facility. This is a drone picture that was taken just yesterday. On the left is um, further progress on the Pure Water Ocean side uh, building site. We've had the foundation um, completed. There are some tanks that are constructed within it. And then around the perimeter of that foundation on the left are the um, preformed concrete walls that were poured um, just recently. The next slide. This video shows construction activity that occurred yesterday. So they are um, putting in place the preformed concrete walls. They're being mounted um, in place. And um, my understanding um, based on a text I got last night was that work was completed uh, late yesterday. And the contractor will move towards um, constructing the roof as well as interior and treatment components in the next coming months. So after the water is treated at the treatment facility, it does uh, get conveyed through a series of pipelines to the wells. And um, we have had normal pipeline work that occurred in North River Road uh, all of last year. In fact, if you attended the groundbreaking ceremony, you probably drove through that construction site. That work is complete along North River Road and we've now moved into pipeline construction along Douglas Drive. What you're seeing here is a pipeline casing. It's a high density polyethylene pipeline that is being um, inserted under the San Luis Rey River. There are two of these pipelines. One will hold the recycled water pipeline. The second will hold uh, the pure water Oceanside pipeline. These were designed in parallel by a design, one design engineer, and they were bid in the same construction contract in order to minimize the public impacts. It also benefits from economies of scale for design and construction activities and minimize, minimizes the traffic impacts. So treated at the treatment facility, it goes through the pipelines, under the river, and then along to a series of injection wells. The picture on the left shows the first injection well drill rig, quite close to homes, quite close to um, a right of way. We have installed sound curtains. We have um, a, a very talented public outreach team that is helping to communicate with the community and businesses that have been impacted by the construction. The two, we do have two injection wells that are currently done with construction. They're right now going, going through testing to see if they are able to convey the 3 million gallons per day of water into the ground. If that's good, if we get 3 million gallons of flow, we won't drill a third well. If it comes up a little short, we'll be drilling a third well. So current construction activities include the drilling of the three monitoring wells. We maintain a very active construction information page, which um, can be found at the website shown on the slide. Uh, we have information on not only the Pure Water Oceanside construction, but also the Recycle Water Pipeline construction that I'll be talking about in the next series of slides. There's also a very active listserv that provides updates via email. We have about 300 people registered for those updates right now. And um, Sarah Davis, who's also on the, the call today, is involved with our NV5 public relations team in providing information um, about the project site. The map on the left right here is a static map, but if you do go onto the, the website, it is, and you click into it, it is an interactive GIS map, which provides real time construction information um, should you um, have an interest. It's very interesting. So this slide shows the ultimate recycled water system once constructed um, throughout the city. This is uh, a very ambitious 
ambitious and uh, costly uh, series of projects. I'll be talking though just about a couple of those that are currently or underway or have completed construction, including um, a treatment plant, reservoir, upper and lower recycled water systems, the Fallbrook line that's running through the downtown area as well as customer connections. This is a time-lapse video of DLE construction activities that had occurred at the San Luis Rey <clears throat> site from 2017 to 2020. What you're seeing constructed in the foreground there is the new 3 million gallon recycle water treatment system, which replaced a much smaller and outdated system that we'd had at the plant for about 20 years. Um, the recycle water system consists of a cloth filtration system disinfection with chlorine. So the long tank that you see in the background there is that disinfection area. And um, in the background soon, you'll see a series of cranes that will be constructing or did construct a pre-stressed concrete tank. Um, all of these facilities are currently uh, completed and are online and producing recycled water for the community. This was a design build construction contract and um, it was done in this way to increase the quality of construction as well as reduce the construction schedule, get recycled water out to the community as soon as we could, especially coming off of a drought. Um, this was constructed by CDM and was a little under $16 million in cost. Next slide, please. This uh, shows the lower recycled water planned systems or pipelines. Um, the blue area shows the recycled water system that's currently under construction. And of course, I talked about the areas along Douglas Drive and North River Road um, already. Um, the large customers on this line that will receive recycled water include El Camino Country Club as well as Eternal Hills. Um, so this construction contract also constructed a portion of the Pure Water Pipeline under North River Road, or under um, the San Luis Rey River that we already discussed. Next slide, please. This is planned facilities in um, the north part of the city. It's called the Upper Recycle Water System. It is still in the design phases right now. We were waiting for North River Farms, um, a decision on that with the community. And we're also waiting for the Morrow Hills vision plan to be completed as we need to understand what this will look like after it is finalized and what the, the water demands will be. This slide shows the Fallbrook Public Utilities District land outfall line. This was previously owned by the Fallbrook utility and was quit claimed to the city a couple years ago. We entered into an agreement with them to um, take over this pipeline and reconnect their pipeline to the um, alignment that you see there in the, uh, the pink and white dots. So, um, this line went live last year. The large customer that's currently receiving water under this line is Caltrans. They are irrigating the 76 freeway as well as the five freeway right now. The area that you see in yellow and red throughout the downtown does not have water in it right now. It's currently dry and it's, it's in that condition right now so that we can assess the condition of the pipeline. The pipeline had historically had a lot of leaks in it. So we wanna correct those and uh, make sure that uh, we have a very sound pipeline before energizing it with, with pressurized system. We also have some planned work in the downtown area well, where we'll be construct, constructing some additional pieces of pipelines or spurs off of this main transmission line. And those spurs will start work in the spring of, and summer of this year. There are a lot of smaller customers in the downtown area, including some city meters that feed Tyson Street Park, City Hall, and some medians. This is a list of our current 
customers. Um, El Corazon Sports Complex is one of our, our larger one, Goat Hill, the Oceanside Municipal Golf Course, of course, was one of our original customers. Caltrans was just put online this year. The San Luis Rey facility where we're actually making the waters using it as well. And it also provides um, water for the environment for Wayland Lake Bird Sanctuary. Currently accounts for approximately 1% of the water used in um, the city of Oceanside. We um, also had hired a conversion consultant to facilitate 68 identified large potential recycled water users with their recycled water conversions. And that, that work is currently underway to conduct site evaluations and um, get folks connected for when those pipelines are done. And last slide here. Um, so after phase one, which is the middle um, pie graph here, we'll have achieved 33% of our local supplies locally by implementation of the, the two projects that I just spoke about. So lots more work to be done in the coming years. Um, after phase one is about a five-year timeline from now. Phase two is um, 2030 and beyond. And um, boy, taking a lot of effort for us to get there, but we're very pleased with the progress that we've uh, made thus far. So I am going to turn it over to Sandy for her portion of the presentation. Thank you, everybody. Good morning, um, Carrie. Excellent presentation and congratulations. What work has gone on in the last year is absolutely amazing. Um, uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Sandy Curl, General Manager for the San Diego County Water Authority. And I just wanted to start out this morning um, and acknowledge our um, folks who are on the phone today from our uh, congressional offices and just offer my um, heartfelt um, support and prayers for everything that's happening in DC. Um, it's been kind of an unbelievable time. So just wanted to start off with that. Um, so as Scott had introduced me, um, I've been the general manager of the San Diego County Water Authority officially since November of 2019. And I will tell you when I uh, took this role, I could have never imagined the amount of challenges that we were going to have and the types of challenges with COVID. Um, but the really good news is with all of our 24 member agencies and partners like um, the city of Oceanside, we all together have collaboratively been able to deliver the water 24 seven. And obviously during a pandemic, having access to fresh, safe water is critical. Um, and it really has reaffirmed my faith and um, our staff and the water community and wastewater community and our ability to manage through really tough times. Today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the role of the Water Authority in the region and then share with you some top issues that we're working on. Next slide, please. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Water Authority, we were created by the state legislature 76 years ago. Um, we are the region's wholesale water supplier. Um, we provide service to our 24 member agencies, 3.3 million people, and help support our $245 billion economy. Um, our board has 36 members. Um, it's made up of 24 member agencies. And um, it's uh, quite a large board, but one that is very engaged in the community and has been working to serve this region um, for many, many years. In San Diego County, while we have a lot of natural resources and beauty in San Diego, we don't have a lot of natural water resources, as you just heard Carrie talk about creating new local supply. So we, along with our member agencies, have worked diligently and strategically over the past three decades to diversify our water supply. And that has um, ensured that the region has been uh, served by adequate water that we've been able to maintain our quality of life. And those next increments of new water coming into the region are through our member agencies, such as 
the Osage Slide Pure Water Project, City of San Diego Pure Water Project that has just started um, construction. As we saw doing the last couple of droughts, um, we have been able to manage through those very well because of our uh, own reliance on local supply. And it has taught us that this approach to diversification and creating a, a portfolio approach to water management has been hugely successful and critical to supporting this region. Um, next slide, please. So as um, some of you may know, we are at the very uh, long uh, end of a very long pipeline. Um, to the State Water Project and the Colorado River Aqueduct. Um, the more, majority of our region's water, about 70% of it, travels nearly 300 miles from the Colorado River to reach the Water Authority Aqueduct system. 11% of our list, uh, water supplies travel more than 600 miles through the California Aqueduct uh, State Water Project. 20% of our local supplies include seawater desalination, surface water, very little, uh, which is the stormwater runoff, um, groundwater, not too much. Um, as you know, um, we are not blessed with uh, groundwater like other areas of Southern California. And then recycled water, which is the purple pipe, which Carrie had talked about a few minutes ago. Um, and uh, with Oceanside's investment in all of those supplies they're adding to the portfolio and the diversification and really helping us to um, continue to build that portfolio approach to water management. Next slide. So I'd like to share with you uh, four top issues um, today uh, that we're working on. And um, the first one, and it also is the background of, of my slide, which is the San Vicente um, a dam. Uh, we are working with the city of San Diego who owns the dam. The, uh, the water authority um, did a dam raise to increase the capacity of storage um, for emergencies. Um, due to that, um, we are able to look at creating a, uh, a, a large uh, energy storage facility, a battery, essentially a large battery to provide long-term solutions to enhance energy storage capacity. Um, the pumped energy storage project is much like a large battery. Um, it would help us to uh, utilize renewables in the regions more, more successfully. And in fact, if this project had been in line in August, we would not have had rolling blackouts in San Diego County. So it's a way to take our current assets that we've invested in for water and solve another issue, which is use of renewables, as well as providing um, uh, stability to the grid uh, for the region. Uh, next, we're undertaking a, a regional conveyance study. The Water Authority has um, been assessing its long-term options for delivering our Colorado River supplies, uh, which we have under contract uh, through the quantification settlement agreement. Um, the new uh, study evaluates potentials for new aqueduct from Imperial Valley. Um, currently, the water is being transported through MWD system. Um, we're looking at this as ways to, can we do it uh, cheaper for the rate payer, um, being focused on ensuring that we are um, the most uh, uh, contained in costs that we can be. The Water Authority um, it's, has completed the first phase of the study, and in November they voted to go to phase B, which will look at further economic analysis. At the conclusion of that phase B study, it will not say go or no go, but will provide more information to the board about what their options are for the period. The study will um, look at uh, partnerships and stakeholders and ways to engage others in the project to help make it economically feasible and um, support better water management in Southern California. Um, next, I go to our urban water management plan. Every five years, um, the state has us put together an urban water management plan. This looks at a 25-year horizon for both the um, demand for water and available supplies to ensure that those two things match up. 
Um, our new plan is due to the state of California by July 1st. Um, the basic elements of the plan include um, an assessment of reliability of water supplies over that time frame that I talked about, a description of demand management measures, and a water shortage contingency plan, and discuss development of imported and local water supplies. And so um, the, the focus on the long term um, is something that we here in San Diego County have done really well. Um, and been very successful again in meeting our needs. And, um, and this is something that has been a top priority for the governor um, on uh, the portfolio approach to water management. So uh, the draft plan will be brought to our board in February. There'll be an opportunity for public review. Um, and again, it will be setting the stage for um, the next long-term planning window. And then lastly, I'd like to um, touch on that we have two member agencies that are seeking to detach from the Water Authority. This is a highly unusual um, situation. It's Fallbrook and Rainbow. And they're looking to do that in their view to see if they can find a cheaper source of supply. Um, they would look to uh, de-annex from San Diego County and annex into um, Riverside County through Eastern Municipal Water District. Um, this is again raises a number of issues, including uh, reliability of supply and the investments that have been made on behalf of all of the member agencies. Uh, the issue is before the LAFCO um, agency right now, and it will play out over the next probably 12 to 18 months. Um, LAFCO is reviewing. Um, all of the documents and it's something that's never happened in the state of California, uh, unprecedented activity. So um, it'll be something that um, you'll be hearing more about as, as we go along. All right, next slide. Um, this has really been an era of um, challenge and opportunities with COVID. Um, we have been meeting virtually with our 36 member board of directors since April. Um, excuse me, since March, um, which sounds um, maybe easy, but had uh, created a lot of challenges, but we've continued to do the business of the Water Authority. Um, we've partnered with uh, San Diego Food Bank to uh, do fundraising um, through our agency and other water agencies to help those in need. Um, food insecurity is a huge um, fallout of COVID and we wanna be part of that solution as well. We've also served as a regional um, supplier to 25,000 of 25,000 PPEs um, to six Southern California agent uh, counties for PPE pr provisions, um, which was critical in the early stages of COVID um, getting access to masks and all those sorts of things. And as Carrie had talked about, we have been very fortunate um, to work with our contractors and continue the critical work of maintaining the system. Our construction projects have been able to um, move forward without incident. Um, that's taken a lot of work um, with the contractors, um, but we're pleased to say that we've been able um, to keep all of those capital projects moving and those improvements going um, that we need to get done um, to ensure that the water is able to um, flow 24 seven. Next slide. Um, since um, becoming general manager, one of the things that I've been focused on with the organization is really uh, working on organizational culture. Um, during this time, obviously we have had additional um, challenges with uh, social unrest and social equity issues. Um, we've done our first ever um, agency-wide employee survey um, and took issues out of that and working on those issues, um, constantly communicating with our employees. Um, since COVID started, I do a weekly call with all the employees and engage and talk about what's happening in the organization. And what's been kind of a silver lining through this process has been that I think we as an organization are more connected than we've ever been because of virtual meetings. Everybody can jump on the line and have a conversation. It's been a way to share information for employees to get to know each other better. Um, 
understand the work that's going on throughout the organization, as well as providing support. I think one of the most challenging things about COVID has been sort of the emotional and mental toll it's taken on folks. And so having that place where people are connected, um, since we, um, in the early days of COVID, moved 75% of our workforce to remote work, and we continue in that operating mode. And I think we will continue in that way for some time, um, especially with the increased wave of COVID cases until the vaccine is fully um, uh, distributed. Um, as you know, um, many of your agencies are dealing with the silver tsunami. And if I can go to the next um, slide, um, with the member agencies, we have what worked and put together um, San Diego Waterworks, which is a website for one-stop shopping for jobs in the industry. There are so many career paths in this industry, things that require a minimal level of education up to very advanced degrees. And this website um, provides jobs, shows how you can um, get to uh, certain positions, what paths are necessary, what educational opportunities are available. And so we're really excited about this. This is a way also to meet the needs of the county for um, very good jobs, um, as well as engaging all communities um, in um, the opportunity to participate in this uh, this business. Next slide. So really, again, the message to you is despite really challenging um, situation this last year, um, we have been very focused on providing service and communicating the safety of the water to the community um, and develop the Trust the Tap campaign. One of the things that we found is that in certain parts of the community, um, folks don't necessarily trust the water based on their background or where, um, what experiences that we've had, they've had. So we've engaged with communities that have been um, not historically engaged with um, huge Hispanic outreach. Um, with the um, fundraising that we've done with the San Diego Food Bank, we have um, flyers that go out in every bag of food saying, talking about the safety of the water and uh, um, that, you know, you can uh, trust the tap and don't have to buy bottled water and spend your um, precious dollars on very expensive bottled water. Um, this campaign and this work through um, with our member agencies has been hugely successful. The feedback has been um, really wonderful um, from folks and I think has really um, started to make an impact on how people um, see um, their public water system and um, has been really uh, quite gratifying. Next slide. So we have a lot of ways to stay in touch. Um, I know Scott has gone through the Citizens Water Academy and Haley mentioned at the start of the call that she got to start the first session and then we had to shut down because of uh, COVID. We were in North County, we were actually in the Oceanside uh, facilities, which we were really excited about. We hope to be able to start up again. We're doing some virtual work. Um, we also have our water news network, um, which has all information, water news and ways to connect. So we hope that you do that and we would love to um, connect with you and engage with you on water. So with that, I really thank you for the opportunity to talk with you today and happy to answer any questions. Great, thank, thank you, Sandy and Carrie. Um, we do have one question that I'll throw out there to, to both of you. Um, have there been any demand changes of, um, with the water supply due to the shift to remote work? I can take that first. I think that we've had some changes in terms of um, the amount of flows that we're seeing coming into the wastewater treatment facilities. It's been minor, but um, um, it's just a little bit of change, I guess. Um, nothing significant, though. Yeah, and I would say from the water authorities and in terms of the water that we're selling, um, it's sort of hard to determine what is COVID related and what is related to having had two wet years and agencies being able to utilize more surface water um, for their demands. So 
Um, we're kind of evaluating that overall statewide um, throughout uh, California water demands overall um, have been down um, both because of the epic of conservation um, and as well as um, you know a focus uh, on the uh, cost of, of water um, but uh, you know specifically related to COVID I still think it's a little bit too early to make that um, that connection. Okay, and another question for you, Sandy. Um, can you talk about the legacy of the 24 member agencies and is there an opportunity to save costs by consolidating? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, you may know that a few years ago, Rainbow and Fallbrook looked at consolidating their two agencies and ultimately did not end up doing that. Um, the uh, Little Hoover Commission at the state has talked about that. Um, it's it's not something that we at the Water Authority would would engage in. That's something that the member agencies would would be looking at themselves um, if that made sense to them. Um, you know, Carrie, you being a member agency, I I throw it back to you. Um, yeah, we. We haven't been in talks with anyone about that, uh, certainly. Um, but, but as as a, a retail agency and as a wastewater agency, we're always looking at ways in which we can partner with other agencies without necessarily that consolidation. So some of the initial work that we did from 2010 to 2012 with some of the planning studies involved about 10 agencies in the North County area. So we had some economies of scale by by working together without necessarily consolidating the agencies officially together. So there are opportunities all the time to do work like that. And I, I just see more and more of that. I think the state and federal agencies um, are also um, very happy to see when we're collaborating with our peers and working together in order to, um, to implement projects, especially these large scale ones. Yeah, I would agree. And I think one thing that is clear is that there is a lot of collaboration among the Water Authority's 24 member agencies and looking to share resources and um, really come together. I think the COVID has been a perfect example of that. And when agencies have needed help, that help has been provided. Um, so there is a lot of that that takes place now. All right. Well, um, that was it for the questions. So I just, again, thank you, uh, Sandy and Carrie for the, for the presentation. We really appreciate it. This will be up and running on the, on the Chamber's YouTube channel probably next week. So um, it will be available to, to share for anyone else that would uh, you'd like to pass this information on to. So thank you again for being with us, both of you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having us. All right, so we are going to move on to our legislative reports. And uh, first, I'd like to uh, call on Kyle Crayhill Frolander from Congressman Levin's office. Yes, hello, good morning. It has been, as you all are aware, a scary 24 hours. Uh, but thankfully, I can report Congressman Levin and everyone on our team is safe. Um, I extend his thanks and gratitude for everybody's well wishes um, as we went through yesterday. Um, so on top of all that chaos, um, you know, we did receive some good news uh, just on Tuesday. Uh, Trump signed Congressman Levin's bill, uh, HR 7105. That is also uh, known as the Johnny Isaacson and David P. Rowe uh, Veterans Healthcare and Benefits Improvement Act. Now, that is a big bill. He co-sponsored it, led it, I should say, led it with Republican Minority Leader Kevin McCarthy. Um, it includes a whole bunch of revisions to strengthen benefits and services for our service members, veterans, and their families. Uh, some of those include uh, allowing the VA to provide more services directly to homeless veterans, um, improving the HUD-VASH housing program that provides vouchers for uh, veterans to get into housing uh, support. Uh, improving the transition assistance program, which is key to uh, getting service members returning to civilian life uh, on their feet, uh, and then much more. Uh, so we're very, very uh, proud and happy that that bill uh, was able to pass um, and get signed into law and get some assistance to our veterans and service members and their families. I also want to mention that uh, as we closed out Congressman Levin's first term last year, 
Um, we did put out a progress report to highlight some of the accomplishments uh, from those past two years. Just to give you some of those top lines from that, Congressman Levin was able to introduce over 53 pieces of legislation in his term. Uh, 14 of those were signed into law. Um, so things do get done despite all the craziness. Um, on the local level, Congressman Levin held 27 town halls. Um, that's part of his commitment uh, to holding one town hall per month while he's in office, and he'll continue to do that um, into the next term. We also were able to respond to over 115,000 messages from constituents. So if you or anyone you know uh, needs something, please encourage them to reach out to us, especially on our website. Uh, we respond to them uh, in, in as fast as we can. And here in the district office locally, uh, we were able to help over 875 individual constituents when they were having a problem with a federal agency. Um, and we were able to save them over $2,149,000. Um, so we look forward to really increasing those numbers next term. Um, we figured out how we were, how, what we were able to do and what we were able to not do. And we're gonna be looking forward to being better next time. And over the next two years, Congressman Levin just looks forward to continuing his work, supporting veterans, protecting the environment, uh, getting the nuclear waste off of San Onofre, securing our local water supplies, uh, keeping sand on the beaches, uh, and so much more that he's already been fighting for. So as always, if you have any questions um, or you have anything that the Congressman is doing, uh, reach out to me anytime. I'll leave my email in the chat and I'd be happy to chat with you. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate it. And, and I just want to acknowledge that um, the Congressman was a strong advocate for the chambers and other 501c6 organizations to be included in, in this current round of PPP loans. So we are very appreciative of that. Um, so with that, I'd like to call on Matthew Fye from uh, Senator Pat Bates' office. Thank you, Scott. Uh, first off, um, typically we, we would already be starting the um, new California state uh, legislative session. Uh, it would typically start on Monday. They did push that back uh, to next Monday, the 11th, uh, due to the rising COVID numbers. Um, I'm sure we might even see another delay uh, from there. Um, but it's, it's, they're just trying to plan ahead and um, see how we will operate in this new environment. Um, so that's going to be tricky moving forward. Um, in terms of uh, legislation on the legislative side, um, Senator Bates did uh, pen a letter uh, with a group of bipartisan uh, lawmakers um, on December 11th um, relating to the uh, California restaurant industry. Um, it uh, essentially said that uh, Senator Bates and the other uh, legislators wanted the restaurants to be classified as essential businesses. Um, according to the California Restaurant Association, 11% of the employment in the state comes from this um, sector. Um, and so we know these businesses are really hurting um, and we know that they've made a lot of um, changes and ways that they operate to operate safely. Um, and so we think that they should be able to open and open safely and still be able to operate because there's a lot of people that rely on those jobs. Um, so she did send that. Unfortunately, we have not heard back from the governor yet um, on that um, and I'm not sure if we will. Um, <clears throat> moving forward on the legislative side again, um, Senator Bates has co-authored a bill SB 7474 um, with uh, another senator uh, based on the legislative analyst office uh, projection of a small uh, surplus. There's kind of different pots of money. This is one area where the uh, state is expecting a small surplus. Um, and so we are uh, saying in that legislation to use that $2.6 billion uh, to help our small businesses in the state uh, that have been affected by COVID. Um, and so we think that that would be a great use of the money to help a lot of these businesses that have been hurting um, and that uh, desperately need some assistance. Um, also, uh, Senator Bates has uh, co-authored a bill um, relating to the EDD, the Economic Development Department. Uh, this is the department that handles unemployment um, insurance and benefits, uh, which we have all heard a lot about. Um, this bill, SB 58, uh, would immediately end the practice of including full social security numbers on the uh, mail documents from this agency. Um, as I'm sure you've all read about the uh, rampant fraud that's been occurring um, through the EDD and the benefits uh, that have been paid out. Um, and so one of the largest problems, obviously, is that these documents do contain full social security numbers. Um, that's a very big security risk, identity theft risk. Um, and so um, I think you're going to be seeing not only this piece of legislation, but a lot of legislation uh, moving forward that's related to the EDD and taking a look at things uh, went wrong or that uh, didn't go very well and how we can change that moving forward. Um, other than that, please continue to reach out to us. We're still handling a lot um, of EDD cases coming in. Uh, the most recent issue, we had a great question um, in a meeting the other day 
about um, a lot of folks are receiving a message saying that their account's been frozen uh, through B of A, which is what the state uses to distribute those unemployment benefits. And it's all been relating to a new layer of ID verification or security that they've um, that EDD has implemented. Uh, we didn't know about this. We weren't uh, warned about this, uh, but kind of everybody got this uh, notification that their account was frozen. Um, supposedly, the EDD was reaching out to people yes, starting yesterday, uh, January 6th, um, and either giving them a phone call, an email, and or um, mailing them a physical uh, piece of paper uh, demanding or requiring some more documentation. Um, and so that's caused quite a few issues. Um, we've just gotten in a very large number of phone calls and emails all about this. Um, so if you do hear something like that, um, it's definitely something that's going on and there's not much we can do um, because these individuals do need to provide certain documentation. Um, and once that is provided, then the funds will be released is what we've been told. So. Um, kind of a difficult situation, um, even more so, um, but please continue to uh, send folks our way so that we can help them out with these issues. Thanks, Matthew. And, and on, on that letter you mentioned, um, uh, for, on behalf of the restaurants, we really appreciate that. That's been circulating around the chamber industry, and uh, it's very important um, that, we, that we continue to stand for our restaurants. They are, they are hurting through this, um, through this crisis, so thank you. Um, next, I, I'd like to call on um, Fernando Hernandez from Assemblymember Tasha Borner Horvath's office. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so on behalf of Assemblymember Tasha Bernal Horvath, I just want to take the time to wish you all a happy new year. Hope you had a wonderful holiday season. Um, as we start the new year, the assembly member looks forward to continue building upon our successes from this last session, working for small businesses. So this comes from her legislation, such as AB 1731, which streamlined the state's workshop program, AB 1577, which she co-authored with assembly member Autumn Burke. Uh, to conform state and federal tax law in terms of the Paycheck Protection Program and federal small business relief funding. And lastly, Senate Bill 1447, which she co-authored with Senator Stephen Bradford, which established the Main Street Hiring Tax Credit. So we're encouraging small businesses to visit the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration by January 15th to apply for a tax allocation. Um, in this legislative session, the assembly member will continue to serve on various legislative committees that will continue to address several issues that are arising from the COVID-19 pandemic. And this includes the assembly committee on communication conveyance, local government, aging and long-term care, veterans affairs, and the joint legislative audit committee. But she especially looks forward to being an effective voice for North County small businesses through her new committee assignment on the Assembly Committee on Jobs, Economic Development, and the Economy. So we're all very excited about her participation in that committee to represent San Diego small businesses and workers. Um, recently, as you've all heard, the governor and the legislature worked to release a, a small business stimulus grant program that will provide critical relief during this time. Um, the deadline has been extended to January 13th. It is important to keep in mind that this is not a first come first serve program. So all small businesses that submit an application by the 13th will be considered for the first round of funding. Um, small businesses are encouraged to apply through one of the state's regional partners um, that are suited to help small businesses navigate through the process if they need assistance. They can provide technical support if they, they come to a roadblock for some reason. Uh, small businesses in our region are encouraged to reach out to the San Diego Small Business Development Center. Um, there are local um, SBDC here, so if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to their team. Um, those that did not receive funding in this first round uh, and were not disqualified will be automatically considered for the second round. So to learn more about that program, if you haven't already, you can visit careliefgrant.com for more information and to view one of the webinars. Um, if you want to prepare before submitting an application. Uh, the governor also recently announced uh, his proposal for an equitable recovery for California businesses and jobs in the 2021 budget. And that includes an expansion of the California Small Business Relief Grant, an expansion of the California Main Street Hiring Tax Credit, which was, again was established under Senate Bill 1447, which Assemblymember Bernard Horvath was a co-author of 
um, an expansion of California competes tax credit eligibility. He also announced a few waivers for small businesses that were impacted the most during this pandemic, sales tax exclusions. Uh, additionally, he announced uh, additional programs for the California Rebuilding Fund, uh, funding for workforce development programs and housing development programs. So that will look like grants for um, local infill, inf infill infrastructure grants. Uh, so the assembly member looks forward to work with the legislature and the governor uh, to continue to create an equitable path for small businesses moving forward. Um, and I also look forward to working on her team as still a field representative for the city of Oceanside to work with its local government, its communities, nonprofits. Uh, and just like Scott, I also like to support the uh, Pure Water Oceanside Little Cup. <laughs> it's always great to, you know, be able to share some of the great accomplishments happening in our city uh, with the assembly member and share ways we can continue to support um, its economic development moving forward. So please feel free to contact me if you have any questions uh, or if you need assistance with a state agency, just as Matthew said, our office has also been um, busy over the past couple of months helping hundreds of constituents uh, resolve um, issues they've been having with the um, EDD. Uh, so if you know of anyone um, that needs assistance with, with the department, please let us know. Or if your business is just running into a blo uh, roadblock uh, with your business with a state agency, please you know contact me directly and we'd be happy to assist. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando, and uh, thanks for the for the work on the on the work share um, on the work share program. We know that that originated out of a conversation with um, one of our neighboring chambers. So it's good to see when legislation originates out of um, interaction with the business community. So thank you for that. Um, with that, I'd like to call on uh, Crystal Jabara from County Supervisor Jim Desmond's office. Good morning and happy new year, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with Oceanside. And I wanna start off by saying thank you to the chamber for um, always hosting these fabulous meetings and for everything that you're doing to support our businesses and communities. Um, you're a valuable partner and we really appreciate it. Um, with the new year, the new board was sworn in for the Board of Supervisors. They have their first official board meeting next week. So we're looking forward to that and working with the new board members. Um, the, uh, each district is still awarding grant funding that's coming through the COVID stimulus dollars. So those um, are being sent out through the Office of Financial Planning. Um, people have been notified that they'll be receiving those grant dollars, and um, hopefully we'll have more to come for everyone. In the meantime, we're also accepting from our nonprofits, our community enhancement and neighborhood reinvestment grants, um, and trying to get some of that out to people who need it. It looks a little different. Starting last year, there were some exceptions um, that money was able to use for operation expenses, which is unusual, but during these times of the pandemic, some exceptions are being made. So any nonprofit that would like to apply for that, you can reach out to our office. Um, today, the supervisor will be hosting a town hall on vaccines. And we initially started with 500 people maximum. We are now up over a thousand. So I'm assuming that's gonna be well attended. A lot of people have questions about vaccines, different phases, how it's gonna be rolled out, when they'll receive it, Obviously, we're still in phase one of rollout, which is our first responders, healthcare providers, uh, more of those frontline workers. And then we'll move into, we're waiting from the state for their guidance on how it's gonna be rolled out to our educators. And so we can get our schools back open, which has been a big priority and will be very helpful of getting people back to work when the kids can go back to school as well. Um, the supervisor is continuing to be an advocate for a balanced approach, which is keeping people safe and keeping businesses open. Stimulus dollars cannot cover people's mortgages, rents, payrolls, um, all the expenses that are coming in, and we prefer to see people at work safely, um, keeping the most vulnerable protected. Um, beyond COVID and everything that's going on with COVID, the supervisor is still advocating for the improvements on the 78 freeway. They're under, um, they're doing the public outreach for the 78 and 15 improvements. We would like to see that continue all the way through the five and have all those improvements done. So he will 
um, I think until his dying breath, be an advocate for the 78 freeway and the improvements. So when everyone gets back to work, we don't have the traffic jams that we've been having. Um, obviously still priority on mental health and our crisis stabilization units. Um, excited to see Tri-City Hospital moving forward on their build for their behavioral health uh, building. And also for parks and trails, which the supervisor, even back when he was a mayor, was an advocate for parks and trails. And with the San Luis Rey River Park master plan underway, which will be two large public parks and trails that connect the ocean all the way to the 15. So we're excited to see that coming on. And I think I covered a lot of information. So if anyone ever needs any assistance or has questions, my contact information is in the chat. Please feel free to reach out anytime or um, reach out to the chamber and they'll make sure to connect you with us and we will make sure your questions get answered. Thank you, Crystal. We appreciate it. And uh, the supervisor has consistently been one of the strongest pro-business voices in the county. So. We're grateful for his continued support. Thank you. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, call on council member Christopher Rodriguez to uh, give a brief update from the city of Oceanside. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Chamber, for hosting this uh, amazing meeting. Uh, great presentation by the Water Authority. I'm a fellow citizens graduate. I love that course. And hopefully after COVID settles down, we can get more Oceanside residents involved in, in uh, graduating from that um quickly last night we had a great council meeting um we move forward as a council unanimous support of business grants uh, originally we brought forth with you know partnering with the chamber and main street uh, a loan concept with low or no interest um was not very successful we, were, we ended up helping eight businesses and uh, we have a lot of funds left over so we move forward on on considering a grant program. So what we approved last night was up to 750,000, up to 7,500, elimination of unneeded restrictions that we learned from the loan issuance. And uh, we're not overlapping anything. So if you're, if you're a restaurant right now and you're following health and safety protocols and you need to apply for a grant, well, guess what? Apply for the grant and we're gonna support you. Um, and those who have received the loan already and they went through that process uh, we're also going to honor them and we're going to um, we're going to knock off you know the the grant amount they would have received if they applied we're going to go ahead and knock that off their principal balance to help keep them going uh, because some of those businesses are are, are still struggling and they're not going to be able to to pay back that loan anytime soon with all these uh, lockdown restrictions uh, we approved uh, a breakdown of additional C CDBG funds, which is COVID related. And uh, that's in the amount of uh, 1.2 million. Um, I think as a council, we, we conveyed to staff that we want more of an emphasis on the rental assistance side of it and meal, meal delivery. Um, you know, I think a lot of phone calls I get from constituents um, that are unemployed right now due to COVID is they can't pay their rent. They can't you know, pay their basic bills and it's not their fault. They want to work. You know, I think that's, that's needs to be a huge emphasis here. You know, when these small businesses are shut down, it's not just that small business owner, it's the hundreds and hundreds of employees that can't work, that cannot pay their bills and the stimulus checks are not cutting it. And so, um, um, so we, you know, we really want to support those families that need rental assistance and the fundings there and uh, staff's going to work really hard to process as many applications as possible and uh, assist families that are needing some rental assistance. But outside of that, you know, we're, we're uh, a pro-business city and we're going to continue to fight for our businesses and be a light here in North County for all small businesses. So thank you very much. Thanks, council member. And uh, just in watching last night's council meeting, I was just really pleased to see the, the level of um, pro-business attitude on, on behalf of our council. So, um, and as, as the council member mentioned, um, the chamber is involved, um, chamber and Main Street in administering the small business grant program. So we are expecting to have um, our applications up on our websites no later than Monday and uh, businesses will be able to um, begin applying for those grants. Um, so. We look forward to that partnership. Um, with Thank that, you. just uh, any other quick updates um, before we close out the meeting? Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Well, with that, I just want to wish everyone a happy new year. And uh, again, thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Our next meeting will be on February 4th. And at that meeting, we will be having our, an our annual um, Oceanside Economic Development Update. So that's always a very exciting meeting and uh, we'll be doing it right here on Zoom. So um, we look forward to seeing you all next month and uh, have a wonderful day, everyone.